Welcome to another edition of Rebellion's Educational Series. Today we'll be conquering cosmology with brilliant physics professor, Dr. Stefan Alexander from Brown University. Dr. Alexander, thank you so much for coming out. It's a real pleasure to be with you. So tell us about your work. I see you're applying machine learning to dark matter. How very cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's one of these strange things that happens, I think, in one's um, career as a scientist that you never expected. The, th the thing that you least expect to happen happens later on. And um, yeah, so, you know, as I, I work on um, in, in the field of cosmology, um, which is the oldest science. I mean, the word cosmos, I believe, came from, um, I believe the word was coined by Pythagoras himself um, way back, you know, 500 BC in that, during that time frame. And that word connoted the idea of the order, that which is gave order to our world. Yeah. And in that case, they were trying to understand the motion of the five planets while these stars were fixed. Well, why were these planets moving? They didn't know. It took 2,500 years, going back all the way to Newton. Well, well, why is dark matter even important? What do, you know, from dark matter, is it that we can learn about the Big Bang and the, you know, the beginning of time? Is that really what, uh, you know, is that kind of the end? Yeah, that's a great question. And then I guess we could ask that question um, also um, sort of historically, like why I was trying to understand electricity and magnetism important? You know, when Maxwell discovered finally the four equations that interlinked what was thought to be separate phenomenon, interlinked magnetic and electric phenomenon, you know, they didn't have, had no idea it would lead to motors and it would lead to cell phones and right. But definitely at that time, there was a basic, very powerful thing that makes humans what we are, which is curious. We wanted to know, right? We wanted to understand with very precise, you know, as, much, as best precision as we could, which was through the language of the lens of mathematics, what electricity and magnetism was. And I think likewise, dark matter presents itself in, you know, over the last, you know, couple of decades as an anomaly meaning that it's something that we see, right, for which none of, the, none of, our, of our current understanding of the laws of physics, very precise understanding of physics, just cannot account for. So why, we, why, why it's important to understand dark matter is, I would say, for two reasons then. One is it's saying that there's something about our understanding of the laws of physics as it stands, going all the way back to quantum physics, particle, all the stuff we know really well. How to make the cell phone work really well, all that stuff. How to make the signals transmit right now from my, from, you know, from my computer now to outer space down to your computer. We understand that physics really precisely, but for some reason, that physics cannot explain what we see we have many ways of seeing the effects of this dark or it's called invisible form of matter, 85% of which is the matter around us. It's invisible. And we cannot account for that observation with the laws of physics. So that's one reason. And the second reason is we have no idea how it might impact future technologies. Of course. Well, speaking of ignorance, you know, the Verlinda brothers, uh, you know, Eric and his uh, twin are two of the most renowned uh, physicists on the planet. And... They had this idea that, you know, gravity, you know, that uh, Newton was wrong and that, you know, gra well, are you, are, are you aware of their theory? Do you want to talk about it? Well, I'm very aware. In fact, I know Eric and Herman quite well. And oh, amazing, never, amazing. So please, Eric, we'd love to yeah, hear your take were, on it. Eric gave one of the first talk about that many years ago at Google. I was at, at the Google complex. There was this thing called SciFu that many scientists go to and he gave an informal talk and he and I spoke about it. Um, and... It's a, it's a beautiful idea. The idea is that actually dark matter is not anything that's a real substance. It's just an anomaly of the gravitational force itself. Um, and we call this falls into a class of something called MOND or modified. It's an acronym for something called modified Newtonian dynamics, which is the idea is that what's really going on is that dark matter is nothing more than the statement that Gravity works really well explaining the motion and gravitational forces in our solar system. But when you go out to on the order of the size of a galaxy and beyond, which is on the order of a thousand, you know, 
parsecs. A parsec is roughly three trillion miles, right? So it's a kind of a large distances, but that's usually the size of a, you know, a spiral galaxy made up of stars going around, our star being one of them. And they believe now the idea of, of what the Valen of Eric Valende and people like Mond and Milgram and Beckenstein, these, these are the, some of the key players in this idea, um, is that dark matter is not a thing, but gravity gets modified to accommodate this anomalous behavior. But there are reasons, there's a, it's an ongoing debate. It's currently a research debate, but there's a lot of evidence against it. And that's a much longer conversation to have a much more detail. It has to do, if for, for the audience, if they're interested, they, they can look up, if they maybe do a search on MOND, M-O-N-D, and the bullet cluster, then you'll probably see some nice popular articles talking about this discrepancy or the inability for MON, modified theories of gravity, to explain um, the effects of dark matter. So when we say dark matter, it shows its face in many different ways, many different independent ways, not only in the behavior of galaxies, but when galaxies cluster up by the billions to make superclusters, we see the effect of dark matter there. We also see it in the early universe. Um, we see it also in these objects called dwarf galaxies. So when you to come up with a theory of dark matter, one must explain all of those disparate phenomena, not so just the rotation of galaxies. So jumping to you know strings, I apologize. If strings vibrate through space and strings mm -hmm. are relativistic, are they also vibrating through time? That's a great question. The answer is yes. Um, um, and one way to understand that is that um, a string is a, you can think of it as a one dimensional object. And well, I guess what's the difference between string, you know, vanilla string and, and you know, do you want to just for our viewers mm -hmm. we'll walk back a step and just, you know, give our viewers a background on the difference between uh, string theory and, um, you know, I guess there, there's, there's two branches of string theory. Do you want to get into that? Um, well, I mean, there's a string theory that tries to explain all the forces. I mean, there's another string theory that has to do with... Um, string, you know, sorry, string field theory? Oh, string field theory, okay. I, I apologize, I apologize. Yeah. yeah, so... My memory's not what it used to be. Yeah, so string field theory and string theory, that's, you know, it's definitely a technical difference, but let's say that in string theory, the idea is that you have one string, you quantize this one string, okay. right? And that, the, and that quantization leads to many different sort of discrete vibrations. And that vibration we can understand as a theory where these different vibrations manifest themselves um, as different aspects of what we thought to be the four separate forces It unifies these forces. I mean, do you um, actually believe string theory, you know, encapsulates the loss of our universe? Or do you feel it's more of an interesting framework um, for, ex you know, for exploration? And research. Yeah, I think it's a little of both. Actually, well, it's definitely more of a tech technology. I mean, when I say it's a it's a theory that has a very rich landscape, no pun intended, of um of of knobs that we can turn. And I think as a theoretical device, it's very useful um to study it um and it can give us ideas and inspiration. In terms of it describing the real world, I think there are certain facets of string theory that points to something. But what it points to is something more platonic than the actual real world. Um, but I would say that it is a very great game in town, and I'm very much supportive of string theory. I still publish papers in string theory, how it relates to cosmology. Um, but we, I think we are far away, away from trying to show that string theory, whether or not it makes a prediction or explains some unexplained thing with our real world. But it certainly is definitely worth pursuing. And um, I guess, could we revert back to two questions ago? I apologize, I'd cut you off before. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess, so, so you believe that, they, that, string, that uh, strings are vibrating through time if they're vibrating through space? Yes, yes, so there's a sense in which a string um, does vibrate through time. Um, and one way to understand that is, um, if you look at a vibration... Well, I guess, how does string theory deal with space-time, you know, from a larger perspective? Yeah, so string theory deals with space-time in the sense that 
string theory already is living. It's a string that's actually living in space time already, right? And that space time is, is, is intrinsic to the string. It's a two dimensional space time where one dimensional corresponds to the string and the other is time. And what happens is that that vibrational thing internal to the string, it's intrinsic space time does sort of give an emergent 10 dimensional space time. So it's in a sense that the 10 dimensions in string theory emerges. Um, it didn't first exist. But somehow, because of the patterns of vibrations of the string, um, it leads to this emergent space-time. And that, the details of that has to do with a, a fancy thing not fancy, called the beta function of string theory, which has to do with um, a particular type of quantum effect. Um, well, I guess many higher-level physics problems deal with scatterings of particles. But what about bound states? Uh, a proton, an electron in bound state makes a uh, hydrogen atom. What do we know about the, the bound state of two uh, strings, you know? Yeah, so you can, think, you, know, you can think of like basically a closed string, which exists as a bound state of two open strings. Um, then you can have bound states of strings, basically, where strings can end on a hypersurface called a D-brain, something that I published on a little bit which is if you think of a membrane object and strings ending on these D-brains, that's an example of a bound state. And also, whatever happened to the Amplihudrian calculation technique for scattering cross sections? Does it have any applicability to string string scattering calculations? Now that question came from one of my smartest students. So I, I can't even begin on that one. I think that the idea for the amplitude thing is to one day really, um, it was already motivated. Um, it's, it was a, already motivated by string theory in the sense that um, quantum chromatic QCD, the strong interaction um, is, you know, a, a lot of processes are, are dealt with by scattering amplitudes. And so the idea is, yes, I mean, that's the hope. The hope is one day one will be able to make contact between uh, string theory and amplitude, amplitude to the hedrons, yes. And Dr. Alexander, what's the status of Stephen Hawking's proposed solution to the black hole information uh, paradox? Has it been accepted? Uh, you know, is it flawed? How, how does the community feel about it? I think this, it's still divided. I mean, many people believe if you have a quantum theory of gravity and black holes can be described by a quantum theory of gravity, but by, by, by definition, if it's a quantum theory, information is always preserved because that's the statement of quantum mechanics, the statement of what we call unitarity, conservation of probability. So if black holes are just states in, in a theory of quantum gravity, information is not lost, right? But some people also who can say that, well, we don't know that yet. It's been very hard to really put real black holes in a quantum theory of gravity um, and in that case, I mean, the, the idea that information is lost um, is still taken very seriously. And what that might mean is actually quantum mechanics and or gravity will have to be modified to accommodate that fact, that idea. So the jury is still out, I, I would say. Really? Um, interesting. So do any of the nonlinear extensions to quantum mechanics give uh, any interesting results? when applied to string theory? That's a really good question. Um, the, you know, the ones that I know of, they, 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 they sometimes suffer from the problem of not being relativistically invariant and black holes emerge from a relativistically invariant theory called general relativity. So we'd have to first reconcile those two facts to, make the, to be able to make compatible statements. But um, uh, it's a very, it's an interesting research topic. I'll have to get back to you you and your audience on that one. And Dr. Alexander, do you believe in aliens? Yes, I believe I'm an alien. I believe we all are aliens. If you, if you make a, if you define what an, if, if my definition of an, of an alien is, um, you know, some form of living, um, a, a living organisms on a planet in the universe. Well, let's see, we're living organisms and we live on a planet in the universe. Um, so. <laughs> 
that's that's such a brilliant answer. This was a really awesome conversation. I, uh, you know, I thank so much to our mutual uh, pal, Professor Brian Brian Keating. Though you were the best man at his wedding, so obviously you guys are. That's how I was. It was quite fun. Yeah, Yeah, Professor Keating is brilliant. Really great guy, and you were fantastically brilliant today. I I couldn't be more thankful. You stay safe during these crazy times, Professor Alexander. Uh, Thank you, um, Alex. Oh, no, the pleasure is all mine. Pleasure is all mine.